Today we're going to begin Deuteronomy chapter 21. And this chapter begins with a very odd ritual that Jewish rabbis and ancient Hebrew sages have had a hard time explaining. Christian scholars don't even try to mess with it. And we're going to explore that ritual and see what sense we can make of it. Now this chapter is really divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 9 discusses the problem of an unknown assailant who's murdered someone. Then the remainder that begins is a four-part chapter section that deals with several miscellaneous laws for Israel. Now the key, I believe, to understanding the first part of chapter 21 is that it revolves around the subject of blood guilt. So let's read Deuteronomy chapter 21 together. We're going to read just a small portion of it to get started, just the first nine verses. So if you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're page 219, Deuteronomy chapter 21. If in the land Adonai your God is giving you to possess a murder victim, is found lying in the countryside, and the perpetrator of the murder is not known, then your leaders and judges are to go out and measure the distance between the murder victim and the surrounding towns. And after it's been determined which town is the closest, the leaders of that town are to take a young female cow that's never been put to work or yoked for use as a draft animal. The leaders of that town are to bring the heifer down to a wadi with a stream in it that never dries up, to a place that is neither plowed nor sown, and they are to break the cow's neck there in the wadi. Then the priests who are Levites are to approach. For Adonai your God has chosen them to serve him and to pronounce blessings in the name of Adonai. They will decide the outcome of every dispute and matter involving violence. All the leaders of the town nearest the murder victim <clears throat> are to wash their hands over the cow whose neck was broken in the wadi. And they are to speak up and say, This blood was not shed by our hands, nor have we seen who did it. Adonai, forgive your people Israel, whom you redeemed. Do not allow innocent blood to be shed among your people Israel, and they will be forgiven this bloodshed. Thus, thus you will banish the shedding of innocent blood from among you by doing what Adonai sees as right. Now, the typical approach to this chapter of scholars and teachers is to focus on trying to make meaning out of each of the ritual elements that's involved in this mysterious breaking of the neck of a heifer, a female cow, that's done in response to the problem of an unsolved murder being committed in the local or nearby the local some local community. Now, certainly we will do the same, however, the much larger subject that we're going to begin with today deals with the terribly serious negative spiritual effect that unsolved murder has on the town closest to the place where the victim's body was found, and more correctly, how this affects Israel as a whole. The problem is that the sin of blood guilt, or better, the condition or status of having blood guilt, has been laid upon Israel as a result of this unsolved murder. Now let's talk about blood and blood guilt for a little while, because believers, especially Western cultural Christians, know very little about what blood guilt is and why blood is so important in God's system of justice and jurisprudence. In a nutshell, blood guilt is a serious condition of defilement. It's a sin that is brought upon a person who violates God's laws concerning blood. Now, I'd like to begin by offering a rather sweeping statement that I hope by the end of the day I will have explained in sufficient depth to give you a better perspective on, on what is really a touchy subject. Blood lies at the center of God's justice system. In the way that a fulcrum lies at the center of a teeter-totter. As it swings fully one direction, there's one effect. As it swings back to the other, there's an opposite effect. On one end of the spectrum, the misuse of blood, 
is the cause for the Lord seeking retribution from a man. On the other end, the proper use of blood is the remedy for most blood crimes. As Americans living in a carefully sanitized society, we know almost nothing about the necessity and the role and the centrality of blood in the scriptures because it offends our ears. It causes us to avert our eyes. Sometimes it turns our stomachs merely to talk about it, any more than to sing a few Christian ditties about our Savior's blood that makes us white as snow. Yet as we study the Torah, we find that the Bible has this fascination with blood and at the same time holds the value and necessity of blood in highest regard. As Christians, we have scores of songs that both celebrate and lament the precious blood of Jesus. Non-believers, particularly atheists, like to point out what they regard as this gruesome and barbaric thread of bloodletting and blood spilling that runs from Genesis through Revelation. Christians often avoid the Old Testament largely because of all the bloodletting. At the same time, somehow sort of mentally minimize the role of blood in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation. When one studies the Bible carefully, we find that blood is the main required element to make covenants, as well as to atone for trespasses. It's forbidden to eat, and is forbidden to take the blood, meaning the life, of an innocent person. Blood causes defilement, on one hand. On the other hand, blood is the supreme purifier of defilement on earth. For the ancient Hebrews, for most other ancient cultures, blood was central. It was indispensable in worship. The Bible wastes no time in bringing us to the subject of blood. Because in the third chapter of Genesis, the Lord's own hand brings about the first recorded death in history. When he kills an animal and he uses its skin to cover Adam and Havaz, Adam and Eve's nakedness. Why did God kill an innocent animal in order to provide clothing? There were other possibilities. How about vegetation? Big leaves. Wool. They had sheep. Because from this point forward, the case will be made that only blood can atone for sins against the Lord. So God had a choice. He could take the life of the criminals, Adam and Eve, or he could provide a substitute. And he could accept that substitute's life as both reparation and atonement for the criminal sins. Another God principle concerning blood is also presented early on in the scriptures. Organic life that is filled with blood is different than organic life that exists without blood. That is, animal life is wholly different than plant life. Plant life, though very valuable, is of lesser value in God's eyes than animal life. Plant, I, plant life can be offered to God for thanksgiving, offered as first fruits, but never can plant life be used and offered to atone for sins. And this is demonstrated in that when Adam and Eve felt shame, they used plant life, fig leaves, if you'll recall, to cover themselves. From a physical, rational point of view, those leaves work just fine in their role as clothing. So why did God replace those fig leaves with animal skins? God didn't find those fig leaf garments unacceptable because they offended his, his, his fashion sensibility. 
nor did he think that animal skins were maybe more durable. Rather, it was that the shame that Adam and Eve felt was the result of their guilt. And their guilt was the result of trespassing against the Lord. And trespassing against the Lord can only be paid for with blood, not by plants. Therefore, the Lord had Adam and Eve wear, think about this, wear the result of their offense. Over their physical nakedness was the physical remains of an innocent animal whose blood was taken to atone and pay for their sin. The blood of the animal, spiritually speaking, satisfied God's demand for justice. However, even though the sinful act was paid for, the entire nature of Adam and Hava is now infected with sin. They had broken God's one and only commandment to them. God gave them a one commandment Torah and they couldn't do it. Wow, what a lesson for us, huh? Don't eat the fruit from that one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve inherently knew when they did that because they had eaten from that tree, their sin nature had to be covered. They tried to do it in their own strength with plant life. God says that's not sufficient. Only blood can cover your sin. Only blood can cover your offense. Of course, Adam and Eve weren't consciously thinking in terms of sin. They only knew that they felt shame and thought that it must be because of their physical nakedness. So they sought a physical remedy, like covering themselves up. Blood is physical, of course. All flesh requires blood to exist. However, spiritual beings like angels and cherubim and even Satan and his demons do not require blood in order to exist. Even so, physical blood has a spiritual effect. And it is this spiritual effect that matters to God, so it really ought to matter a lot to us too. Now, the Bible uses a term to describe the ritual taking of the life of an animal as a substitute for the death that's rightly due to the human who has trespassed against God. And that term is sacrifice. Now, I just mentioned early uh, that early on in the Bible, the blood principle was established that life with blood is distinct from life that exists without blood, animal life, plant life. And we find just as early on that mankind, while recognizing the need to sacrifice to God, would usually rather do it in a way each man prefers than to the way God wants it done according to his principles. So we have the example of Havel and Cain, Abel and Cain, who are told to bring a sacrifice to God. Abel brings an animal. Cain brings produce. The produce is, of course, rejected because this apparently is an offering that involves atonement. So plant life is not acceptable. This rule, God's rule, so infuriates Cain that he decides to kill Havel, Abel, and thus we have the first recorded human murder. I want to put this in another sense. We have the first unlawful killing of a human by another human. The Bible also calls this act of murder the taking of blood. Now, we have another principle about blood that's established. The unlawful, unjust killing of a human being creates then what the Bible calls blood guilt upon the perpetrator. And blood guilt is so serious that it can only be satisfied by the blood of the guilty party as a reparation. 
Blood guilt is such an extreme defilement of the person who commits the crime that it causes instant separation between that person and God. To be clear, there are other sins involving blood that also cause blood guilt, and one of them, for instance, is for a human to ingest blood of any kind. We find later on in the Bible, it wasn't permissible up until the time of Noah, after the great flood, to take the life of an animal for food. Up to then, the only authorized source of food was plants. In other words, until the time of the great flood, for a man to kill an animal and eat it was a crime against blood. A crime against God's laws concerning blood, which therefore incurred some level of blood guilt. And out of this also came the prohibition against eating blood, which is different than eating meat. Eating blood means to drink it, um, or to kill an animal by strangulation, or some other means that doesn't permit its blood to drain out before you eat the flesh. Or it can mean to use blood as an ingredient in food. So then, simplistically speaking, Blood guilt arises when a person violates any of the Lord's laws regarding blood, from the eating of it to the unjust killing of a human being to the misuse of it or to neglect the use of it in a ritual procedure. The story of Cain and Abel, though, gives us a strong hint of another negative aspect of blood guilt. Blood guilt defiles not only the perpetrator, it defiles the land on which it occurred. It even defiles the community of people within or nearest by where it occurred. Listen to Genesis 4 as to one of the unintended results of the murder of Abel. In Genesis 4.10, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, because it has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now here we have perhaps the most well-known biblical case of blood guilt, and the result is that the land itself was affected. It's not that Abel's blood necessarily touched the soil, although I imagine it did. And so the contact between Abel's blood and the dirt caused the dirt to be con con, uh, become contaminated with a curse. Rather, the guilt on the soil resulted from its proximity to this act of murder. It produced a negative spiritual effect. Blood guilt both uh, brings with it both a, a, a physical and a spiritual consequence. The murderer had the spiritual effect of cursing the ground because the land bore the effect of the blood guilt that was committed upon it, thus causing the physical effect of the land to degrade and not produce crops as well or as easily as it did before the blood guilt occurred. Now, I can't stress enough. Please hear this. This isn't some ancient superstition recorded in the Bible. If the laws of blood were nothing but the products of men's fertile imaginations, then Yeshua's sacrifice for us was completely unnecessary, pointless. So please understand that while we may find these principles of blood and blood guilt strange to us in modern times, they are not only still fully in effect, they're the reason that the route of redemption history has proceeded along a very purposeful path. And I have the deepest regret that those of us in Messiah's Church who are responsible to teach you about this principle of blood have instead chosen to take the more genteel approach and to simply ignore speaking the truth about the terrible consequences of blood guilt, blood guilt that pile up on our shoulders hour by hour.
I'd like to remedy that, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Now, with that understanding, let's continue with Deuteronomy 21 and dissect those first nine verses. The one and only case that's being discussed here has to do with someone discovering a murder victim, but nobody knows who committed the crime. The assumption is, since the killer has not been identified, then he can't be punished, according to the law, which is that he's to be executed. Notice that the issue is not about finding the killer and bringing him to justice. Rather, it's about what to do about the very serious problem of blood guilt that now rests upon the land and upon the people of the most local community to that land. Notice that this case is further defined as having discovered the body out in the open. The corpse was out in the field. Maybe it was alongside a road. Technically, this does not cover what to do in a situation where someone is found dead inside a city or a village. However, since there's nothing in the Torah that specifically addresses that nuance, rabbis and sages have assumed that certain portions of, of, of this law could be applied to an unsolved killing that took place inside of a town as well. Now, verse 2 speaks of elders and magistrates. Actually, the, the Hebrew is shofet, which is judge, who are to come to where the victim is discovered, and then they begin this legal procedure. And since this law envisions the era when Israel settled in the land of Canaan, and the land has been divided up into 12 territories, one for each of the 12 tribes, then these governmental officials, elders, judges, are of course the ones who preside over matters in their own territory. So, if the crime occurred within the territory of Judah, then it would be the elders and judges who are of the tribe of Judah who would officiate over the matter. Now, their first job is to carefully measure the distance from the location of the body to the nearby towns and determine which town was closest. Great care has to be taken because whichever town is closest, they're assigned the blood guilt brought about by the crime. Now, I want you to have that sink in for a minute because this is not some procedure that Hebrew men just thought up. This is the procedure that the Lord created. Notice how real and vital is the principle that Yehovah created human government to administer his laws on earth, and that their authority to determine where blood guilt lies is completely valid in his eyes. These government officials are being counted upon to determine, as God's earthly agents, which community is going to be held responsible to deal with the blood guilt that's caused by this unsolved murder. The town that is nearest not only bore the guilt, but they're responsible to purge the guilt, to atone for it somehow. If they do not do this, then they remain in their blood guilt before God in perpetuity. Now, the ritual procedure... To absolve this blood guilt begins in verse 3. And it is that the elders of the town located nearest the crime scene are to provide a heifer that's never been used for field work for any work purpose in general. They're to bring the heifer to a nearby wadi, and there they're supposed to break its neck, which of course kills it. A wadi is a riverbed, one that's usually dry part of the year and has flowing water at other times. Now the instructions about the wadi is a little uncertain. The typical translation is that this wadi must be overflowing or strongly flowing. And this is an oxymoron in Israel because there are a few known wadis that flow strongly at predictable times. It is very rare, at least in modern times. So the logical question is, since the ceremony must be done nearby the murder victim's body in a local proximity to the designated village, and certainly within the confines of that tribal territory, what happens in the most usual cases where there is no wadi that's strongly flowing? 
What do you do? Most new scholarship agrees that the translation of the Hebrew word etan as overflowing or strongly flowing is not correct. In other context in the scripture, that same word tends to indicate strong, but like in the sense of hard, a hard surface. In the Bible, for instance, when it speaks of a king or even the Lord with a strong hand, a better translation for the 21st century, to get the literal meaning of those words, is a hard hand. It means ruling without tolerance, unbending, unyielding. Therefore, more likely, this is referring to bringing the heifer to a typical Israeli wadi, one that's unyielding, meaning it's so rugged and rocky that it can't be cultivated, and so it doesn't provide any useful water. Those who have been to Israel with me can picture this pretty easily. The wadis there are dry almost all year, and only occasionally do they have water. And that's usually in the form of a very dangerous flash flood. You'll find a, a line usually of scrub bushes and acacias, acacia trees, which you see in this picture, called shittim in, in Hebrew along these wadis, but they are also rock strewn and the soil is generally inorganic sand. If you tried to remove the rocks to plant things, the next flash flood would just wipe it out. If you planted a crop, they'd be, it'd be gone soon. Not only that, the water that's present beneath the wadi is usually mostly in the form of moist, moist soil several feet down and it's rarely ever suitable for a well. So probably this is speaking about bringing the heifer to a place that cannot and will not be used to grow crops or obtain water. It is there that the town's elders are to break the heifer's neck. Now I want to point out a couple of things about this procedure. First of all, it's pretty cruel. You don't just easily break a cow's neck. The process would be painful. Take some time. And second, this method of ritual killing is spoken of in the book of Exodus, chapters 13 and 34, as the means to slaughter the firstborn of unclean animals. Animals that, due to their species, are not suitable for sacrifice, or they're disqualified for sacrificial use because of their imperfections. There is nothing about this he heifer used in this ritual that indicate that it's not suitable for sacrifice or that it was in any way impure. Now, during this, then during this ritual, we see that the priests come forward. What their role is, we don't really know. They appear to be there mainly to officiate, to assure that whatever the procedure is, it's done correctly. This brings up an important point. The killing of the heifer in response to the discovery of an anonymous anonymous murder victim, this is not a sacrifice. There's no sacrifice going on here. It's already been established by God that the sacrifice can only occur at the tabernacle, later on at the temple, on holy ground. And of course, this particular ritual procedure we're studying can occur any number of places. Further, the priests don't do the killing. There is no altar. And the animal's not burned up with fire. This means it's not a sacrifice. It's something else. Next is another curious aspect of the ritual. The elders of the town that are assigned with the blood guilt wash their hands with water over the body of the heifer, and they recite the declaration that's outlined in verses 7 and 8. Now, many Bible translators say those words spoken by the elders are a vow to God. I don't think they are. Not only is God's name not invoked, which is an absolute must in a vow, but the structure of the sentence doesn't employ the Hebrew participle im at the beginning of the sentence, which is usually what indicates that it's a vow. In other words, with the im, im uh, included, the translation becomes I swear. But without the aim, it's just, I declare. 
The verse in Deuteronomy 21 doesn't have the im. So we have no reason to conclude that it was a vow or an oath. The hand washing is probably a symbolic indication of the innocence of the elders in this whole matter and that they're telling the truth. They're saying that they shouldn't bear the blood guilt because they weren't involved with the killing. They don't know the identity of the killer and they couldn't reasonably have anticipated it or prevented it. This hand washing was so common in meaning in ancient Middle East, in the ancient Middle East, that this is almost certainly what this meant. Even today, what do we like to say? I wash my hands of the matter. Long time expression. Now recall that a long time later, the meaning of that hand washing gesture was still in existence as we read the Gospel of Matthew about Pontius Pilate doing the same thing in this kangaroo court that was convened to sentence Jesus to death when he washes his hands and says to the crowd, I'm innocent of this man's blood. To this very day, we all know that that statement, we say it constantly. Now, back to the town elders' declaration of innocence. Rather than a vow, what their statement amounts to is more than anything else, probably, a prayer, a prayer to God. A declaration to God that is not a vow, that's a prayer. And in this prayer, the elders are directly asking the Lord to absolve them from, from the blood guilt caused by the death of an innocent person, the murder victim. So here's the thing. Since this ritual procedure is not a sacrifice, then what happens with this heifer has no atoning quality. Its purpose can only be one of illustration and demonstration for the people. But it's also an act of obedience to the Lord's commandments. The reality is that it was this prayer that was the key for the forgiveness that they were seeking in this situation. And the elders lean on their already redeemed status for absolution. It is quite literally in the same mold that every modern believer asks God for forgiveness. We're already redeemed. And so our redeemed status gives us the right to ask the Father for forgiveness and mercy. The unredeemed have no such thing available to them. Now note the ending, uh, the ending words of verse 8. And they will be absolved, forgiven, of blood guilt. Uh, forgive me for repeating something I've tried to emphasize many times, but invariably it doesn't, somebody didn't get it. Over and over again in the Torah, when the Lord lays out all of his atoning ritual procedures, the passage invariably ends with the words, and they will be forgiven. And they will be forgiven. <laughs> Folks, this means what it says. These ritual sacrifices, in our case today, a prayer, spoken with a, within a ritual procedure that's not a sacrifice, brought actual, real, complete, unequivocal forgiveness. Not partial forgiveness. Not something like forgiveness. You know, I've heard so many preachers say that in the Old Testament, sins were covered, but they weren't forgiven. I know you've all heard that. That real forgiveness only happens in the New Testament. This is not true. This is false. The issue about covered versus sins absolved or forgiven is a complete red herring. There is no such concept of a sin covered but not forgiven in the Bible, whether the Old Testament or the New Testament. Doesn't, it's not there. Saying a sin is covered is just a colloquialism. It's simply a, a, a word chosen by a translator. Covered, absolved, forgiven all mean the same thing. As a matter of fact, they all translate the same Hebrew word. Kapir or kafar, 
It carries the same weight. They have the same effect. Those Old Testament Hebrews who followed the sacrificial system were indeed forgiven for their trespasses. If one is determined to stick with the word covered in the Old Testament, and there's nothing wrong with that, then there's no basis to ever change it to meaning absolve, expiate, or forgive. In the New Testament, it's the same word. See, this switch in choosing different English words to translate the same Hebrew word is done to try and prove or disguise an agenda. Even a doctrine of men that says no forgiveness ever occurred under the law, only under Christ. So, what did Messiah's sacrifice bring to the table that was different than what happened with all those Old Testament animal sacrifices? Well, at the least, his sacrifice was capable of atoning for things the sacrificial system couldn't. His sacrifice, for instance, can atone for murder. His sacrifice can atone, can atone for idolatry. There exists no such thing within the sacrificial system as a, as a ritual procedure to atone for murder, to atone for an idolater. It doesn't exist. Such a person was permanently correct, cut off, no remedy. He was both physically executed and spiritually separated from God. However, if one truly confesses and repents and trusts in Yeshua, your guilt, even for murder, is atoned for. That said, you're not absolved from having your physical life taken to expiate the blood guilt, nor do you escape earthly justice. Only your spiritual life is affected. Only your spiritual life is assured to continue. Further, the Levitical sacrificial system did not create a path by which a human could have his evil nature exchanged for a new holy one. The effect of this is that no human could ever find his way to heaven. Instead, in Old Testament times, if he died in a righteous state under the laws of the Torah, then his soul or spirit went to a place the Bible calls Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was not heaven, because no man who has not had his nature exchanged for a new holy one can be pure enough to enter heaven. True enough, the Ola and the Micha sacrifices dealt with the sinful natures of men to the extent that the sacrifice allowed a man to have communication with God and be in, in peace and harmony with him. But, they didn't actually cleanse a man's unclean nature. Christ's sacrifice paved the way for a man's natural, sinful spirit, his nature, our nature, to be exchanged for a holy spirit, a new one that has a holy nature. And with this new holy nature, now we can stand before God in his heaven. And of course, there was necessarily sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice under the Levitical sacrificial system. Every new day required new sacrifices for the nation of Israel. Every new occurrence of sin required an additional sa uh, sacrificial atoning ritual. However, there was but one single sacrifice by Yeshua of himself that satisfied a multitude of various sacrifices within the sacrificial system. Plus, his sacrifice acted in a way that additional sacrifices aren't needed, should you sin again. Lastly, his sacrifice could, generally speaking, atone for intentional high-handed sins, while the sacrificial Levitical sacrificial system had no provisions for it. Now, I remind those who've heard this from me before, by the way, that the English word unintentional as, a, um, as concerns unintentional sins isn't precisely in all its aspects like we typically how, uh, typically how we think of that word in our modern vocabulary. It, it's similar, but there's differences. Those are just the major differences. 
between what the sacrifice of Christ did in contrast to the sacrifice of bulls and sheep and goats and so on. But the completeness of forgiveness by God was the same in both cases. Now, back to other aspects of blood guilt. Now, I hope you're starting to get a, a better picture of what blood means and what blood guilt amounts to and just how serious it is. When I conduct communion, it's nearly always in conjunction with Passover. Those of you who have been present know that when I do it, I read a certain verse that Paul uttered in 1 Corinthians, and this verse deals precisely with what we've been discussing. Blood guilt. 1 Corinthians 11.27 who Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. A man will be guilty of blood, the blood of Christ, if he partakes in what we've come to call communion, if he's unworthy to do so. Now, by the way, communion is really the name of a sacrament that was created by the Roman Catholic Church, but it was adopted by most of Protestant Christianity. You won't find that word in the Bible. But by my best understanding, what unworthy means in this context is that it is to be A, an unbeliever, or B, somebody who professes to be a believer but has fallen so far away from unity with God that Christ's sacrifice is simply not efficacious for him. He's, he's renounced it. Something's happened. Now, there is but one single exception in all the scriptures that permits symbolic drinking of blood. For that matter, symbolic eating of human flesh. And that is what has come to be called communion. Yeshua's Passover connection of drinking wine as symbolic of his blood has absolutely no parallel in the Bible. None. Wine in the Bible is always associated with joy, not blood. Real or symbolic drinking of blood to a Hebrew was so horrible and repulsive, I don't have the words to express it. And this revulsion at ingesting blood was ordered and cultivated by Jehovah, by God. And it is explained in his many laws about blood, several of which we've discussed today. The gravity of this situation as concerns eating blood escapes the average Christian. There is a fascinating story in the Gospel of John that might now make more sense to you. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to read just a few verses. John chapter 6. We're going to read verses 49 through 69. 49 through 69. So if you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's going to be on page 1338. Now start at 49 and go basically through the end of the chapter. Your fathers ate the man, manna in the desert and they died. But the bread that comes down from heaven is such that a person may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Furthermore, the bread that I will give is my own flesh, and I'll give it for the life of the world. At this, the Judeans disputed with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed. I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have life in yourselves. Yikes. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is, I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live through the Father, so also whoever eats me will live through me. So this is the bread that has come down from heaven. It's not like the bread the fathers ate. They're dead. But whoever eats this bread will live forever. He said these things as he was teaching in a synagogue in Kfar Nahum, Capernaum. And on hearing it, many of his disciples said, Oh, this is a hard word. Who can even bear to listen to it? But Yeshua, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, This is a trap for you? Suppose you were to see the Son of Man going back up to where he was before. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Yet some among you don't trust. For Yeshua knew from the outset which ones would not trust him, also which ones would betray him. And this, he said, is why I told you, no one can come to me unless the Father's made it possible for him. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back. They no longer traveled around with him. So Yeshua said to the twelve, Don't you want to leave too? Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the word of eternal life. We have trusted, and we know that you are the Holy One of the God. And Yeshua answered them, Didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is an adversary. He was speaking of Yehuda ben Shimon, from Creot, uh, Judas. For this man, one of the twelve, was soon to betray him. Okay. In verse 61, after Yeshua has pronounced the absolute necessity of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and of course this is symbolically, he asks a rhetorical question as he watches many of his followers walk away from him. I'm sure some of them are running in disgust. And his question is, oh, does this offend you? What this is he referring to? Of course it was this message of eating his blood that caused absolute revulsion even among those who had dedicated themselves to him. And then he goes on to say that these words are in spirit indicating what we all inherently know, which is that in no way was he speaking of literal, physical, eating flesh and drinking blood. It was symbolic of a spiritual decision to come into full unity with him. Long after Christ was dead, Paul warned in 1 Corinthians that those who are unworthy shouldn't drink of Yeshua's blood, take communion, so we call it, or else that person will bear blood guilt. And what's the penalty for blood guilt? If the perpetrator is known, his life has to be taken. And a central rule of blood in God's justice system is that when innocent blood is shed, the blood of, a guilt, of the guilty is required by God as payment. No exceptions, no substitutions. And this required blood of the guilty is not the blood of atonement. It's the blood of retribution. It's the blood of a debt owed to God. Now I want to end this lesson by pointing out some additional principles of blood guilt. And the reason for my pointing out is that this out is as, as a challenge to all of us. This is not easy. We live in a land that is so contaminated with blood guilt that our natu national future is completely predictable. Destruction. Right along with the rest of the world. Count on it. How could we, as supposed Christian nation, merit blood guilt, and where does our blood guilt lie? In our refusal to take the life of murderers. Instead, to simply warehouse them in jail until they die at the end of a relatively normal lifespan. Much of the church, much of Judaism, says, oh yes, this is humanitarian mercy. A few years ago, I think you might remember this, 
There's a case, a horrific case, of a non-repentant Muslim terrorist who planned and executed the bombing of an airplane that exploded over a place called Lockerbie, Scotland, killing close to 300 people. He was set free from prison for humanitarian reasons. He had cancer. So he was sent back to his own nation of Libya, a free man, given a hero's welcome, and guess what? He lived for three more years, lavished with admiration and money. Not only was his life not taken for this massacre, he was set free just because he was ill. All this based on some macabre and, 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 and secular humanist philosophy of mercy and forgiveness. But God says such a thing is a refusal to obey His commandments. Murder brings blood guilt upon the land and the community, not just upon the criminal. And the only way for that blood guilt to be absolved is to take the life of the murderer. That's God's law. Many states in our nation have for decades refused to execute murderers. Even states that have the death penalty have found innumerable reasons to spare the life of a premeditated murder, even of serial killers. We all live today in a land soaked in blood guilt, and the Lord is going to act in His time, in His way. I can't tell you how it's going to look. I don't know. And going to be good. Again, there is only one prescribed method for dealing with blood guilt. Execute the perpetrator. If you don't, then the entire community bears the guilt right along with him. That's God's law. Now I want to close with a related question that any Christian who's been saved for even a few years should by now have asked him or herself. Why is the coming battle of Armageddon that's going to be led by who? Jesus. Right? Led by Christ. Pretty clear. So bloody. Without mercy. No mercy. You see, Armageddon is a holy war of complete and absolute annihilation. In many ways, it's very similar to Noah's flood. <laughs> We're the only people spared for those in the ark. The only survivors of the War of Armageddon in the entire world are going to be those who profess Yeshua before the battle begins. Those who try to convert during the battle get the same treatment as those who don't. Destruction. Christ is called the Blood Avenger in the Battle of Armageddon. I hope you're now starting to see what that term means. The Lord has declared the entire world is culpable of blood guilt. We in this room are but blood guilty because, among other things, we're part of a nation that doesn't prosecute abortion doctors. We actually make it legal. We pronounce it as a good thing. We in this room are blood guilty because we have, in our nation, convicted murderers who are not having their lives taken to absolve their blood, blood guilt, and instead they're simply serving long prison sentences. You know what? You know a statement I just hate? That a criminal is paying his debt to society. I don't know about you. He's paying nothing. I'm paying. Every day that person is prison doesn't cost him, cost me, cost you. We're paying his debt to society. So, since we won't do what is required to remove all blood guilt, guess what the Lord's doing? He's sending his blood avenger. Not my term for him. Not my term. The Bible's term. His blood avenger. Yeshua HaMashiach, to do what? What the law has always demanded. Take the blood of the guilty for spilling the blood of the innocent.
and a community or society that refuses to take God's justice upon the blood guilty is guilty by membership. I want to point out that this is neither a call, let me say this loud and clear, or an excuse for vigilantism. You don't take the law in your own hands, folks. You don't ever. We have a justice system. And if there's problems with it, we need to work hard to change it. But it also points out one of the prime reasons why we need to study the Word of God so thoroughly. And also to rush to accept what Yeshua has done for us. Those of us who ought to bear the price for our blood guilt, we've had it paid for by somebody else. Messiah. But that only applies to those who actually trust in who He is and what He's done. It doesn't apply for the whole world. Just those who trust. Next week, we're going to continue in Deuteronomy 21 as it concerns families and the spoils of holy war. So with that, would you please rise?